Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. I've, I must admit to, to feeling quite um, slightly overwhelmed to be in such esteemed company here. Um, I'm not an academic. Um, I'm, um, I work for the local authority, Durham County Council. Um, as Laura said at the beginning, I've, I've, I've worked for the local authority for the um, best part of uh, 15, 15 years, um, looking at climate change and energy projects and things have changed massively over that time. Um, you know, to the point where, you, where now, yes, we are getting involved in some really, really exciting projects. Um, not that we weren't previously, of course, but things have changed and the scale of things have changed massively as well. So today I'm just gonna run through the process that we went through for our Louisa Center Mine Water Heating Project. Some of the problems that we encountered um, and where we are now. Just thought very quickly it'd be useful to set a little bit of context. Um, the council declared a climate emergency back in um, 2019. We have a target to reduce CO2 emissions by 80% uh, by 2030. That's for council emissions. There's also uh, an ambition to become carbon neutral um, across the county Durham by 2050. We adopted a climate emergency response plan, the SERP, in February 2020. And this was a two year action plan with over 100 actions, many of which were costed. Um, so, the, I just thought it'd be useful just to set this out as well, that, that in terms of the scale of the challenge for ourselves as a local authority, um, in terms of our buildings. So this is our sort of carbon footprint. Heat makes up 44% of our carbon footprint. Obviously electricity is getting, you know, as, um, as Charlotte mentioned before, electricity is getting, be getting better because partly because the um, grid is decarbonizing, but heat still makes up a significant proportion of that. 43% currently of our heat is from um, is from natural gas. Um, we've got some schools and things like that on, on oil, you know, but um, yeah, the, the coming off our reliance on of gas is something that we need to do by 2030 if we are going to hit our 80% reduction target. That's not an easy task um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and obviously mine energy is one of the things that we are considering in terms of how we can um, take heat projects forward. So <clears throat> coming on to speak about Louis Centre uh, specifically, um, this is a building built in 1979, um, is in need of some sort of uh, re refurbishment. Um, it, 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 it needs some lightning, heating, um, hair, ha hair handling units, um, insulation. It's actually one. It's one of the top five buildings in terms of energy consumption in in uh, is is the sort of one of the council's assets. Um, it's five thousand five hundred meters squared. It's a behemoth of a building. Um, it's been added to over the years, you know, so it's quite complex. Um, you know, but there's this, you know, I say there's a specific high heat demand. There's two swimming pools. There's a, you know, 33 meter pool and a, and a learner pool as well. The reason why when we were developing this project, we thought of the Louisa Center was basically because of the, um, we knew that there was very, very close proximity to mine workings. So this is a photograph of the, um, of the Louise Center. This is the building here. Uh, as you can see, the, that, that, was, that was added in the 90s. That's the swim pool area, big sports hall there. I don't know if you can see me cursor, hopefully you can. Um, so yeah, it, there's, you know, it's- Yeah, we can quite, see that okay, Stephen. Yeah, yeah, it's a quite complex building layout. And uh, the Louise Center is named after the Louisa Pitt which was sited on the exact location of the Louisa Center. So this is the, um, the historical map uh, from 1929, and the Louisa Center is basically right about here um, next to the coal depot. 
going forward, as um, Charlotte was showing you, shown there before, this is uh, one of the call authorities interactive maps, which shows some of the um, mine locations. That, that was sort of the first thought, um, whether or not we could use one of the um, mine entry locations, the shaft, if you like, to to utilize um, the, the to, to extract the heat from that location. Um, and again, another um, another mine plan, as Charlotte was saying, and that it overlays the Louisa Center on top of the on top of the mine um, the mine workings. So the original idea, um, and here I have to give credit to Charlotte as well, um, uh, who, who sort of gave us the, the idea from a presentation that she did um, uh, about Spennymore, um, which was which must have been about sort of four or five years ago now, I suppose. Um, so the idea was to access the mine water within the coal seam in order to heat the Louisa Center. We estimate, um, that there would be possible a possible reduction of around 500 tons of CO2. Um, will it work? What was the depth of water within the seams? What was the temperature of the water? Flow rate? Lots of things to consider, and especially around for a local authority, the cost and return on investment, and what funding was was available. So we decided, therefore, to procure a Geo Energy Durham part of um, Durham University to investigate if it was indeed practical to develop the scheme and to answer some of those questions. One of the key issues we ran into at the beginning was the estimation of um, space, um, of annual space heat and demand for Louise Center, which was around about sort of 4,000 megawatt hours. Uh, the pool demand is around about 560 mag megawatt hours. It was at that point after sort of consultation with the experts that we decided to concentrate on just basically the pool demand, given the amount of heat that was required um, and the temperatures to supply the, the, the space heating for the, for the building. We still estimated, you know, that, that even if we did the project, if we continued the project forward, that would still be a reduction of about 1% of our total carbon footprint, just heating the swimming pools. So following on from the feasibility, we started to identify what the next steps were. <clears throat> a big part of that was funding, particular ARDF. At the time, we were very confident in getting the ARDF, and you know, we were sort of going on on to um, very much on onto their time scales. Um, we applied and were successful in an out outline bid under priority access four and started to develop um, the sort of REBA stage three work, um, which was needed in order to submit the sort of full bid. Um, and I suppose this is where we start to learn, to learn the lessons. Um, you know, we got internal project managers involved, looked at the risk profile, return on investment, timescales, and I suppose things started to look tight in terms of delivery. The next step was to get further work done which was really sort of an estimation of the sort of mine water resource. So this was probably perhaps one of the most important parts of the process, which was actually getting the coal authority on board. Um, there's been many, many projects, which obviously Charlotte will, could, could tell you about where, you know, people have went ahead without the coal authority involvement. Um, you know, that, that, that certainly wasn't the case with us. You know, we, we, we got the coal authority involved at the very early, at the very early stage. Um, in order to, you know, help us identify where the right areas are, what we need to do, um, you know, estimate the, the mine water resource sector. So they did this report. They highlighted six borehole options. The best option was 160 meters below ground level. They estimated the mine temperatures to be between 10 and 15 degrees Celsius. Floor rates expected to be in excess of five liters per second. The only sort of relatively unknown is what the water level in the mine would be. You know, you, yeah, okay, you're drilling down to 160, me 160 meters, but you know, the hope was that the water would come up, you know, significantly um, above that magic 100 meters mark that Charlotte mentioned before. 
So it was at this point we really you, we had to take a little bit of a step back. Um, we thought we we could have applied. There was a difference of opinion in in some in some officers at the, at the council whether or not we could apply for ERDF funding for the full scheme, including including you know basically two boreholes because we need an extraction borehole and a reinjection borehole. Um, however, others thought that to have any certainty of the costs um, included in, in an application, we would need to drill a first build a, a first borehole. Um, there was questions on whether or not that would be a sort of um, a trial borehole. Um, you know, or, or whether or not we just go down and, and, and do and do the main one. Um, so we were in a little bit of a sort of catch twenty two at that point. Um, so in, 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 at that point, we did with, withdraw the ERDF application with the intention of further examining the resource and um, developing a new action plan following the uh, drilling of a first uh, borehole. So we went out and did some soft market testing and got cost estimates between about 80 and 170,000 pound. Funnily enough, when we went out to tender, those cost estimates increased massively um, to 160 to about 300,000 pound. And the levels of risk were differed greatly between contractor to contractor. Some uh, contractors wouldn't really accept much risk at all. Others would accept some risk. So it, it was it was quite a difficult process in terms of getting a contract on board that we were comfortable with in terms of both our level of risk and their level of risk. We did have the call authority to act as project consultants on the scheme. So you know, I think that 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 was extremely important to have. You know that. The, the professionals, if you like, on on board, so there was constant discussion with the contractor. So <clears throat> it shows a picture of the drilling rig, which was set up. Um, lovely view across uh, across the valley there. Um, and I have to say, just just a little bit of a tangent. There was no complaints at all from residents, you know, just to the side, just to the basically to the just to the left over right here, there were some houses. Never had one complaint over noise. The, 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 the contracts were whether or not it was just this contractor or sort of the drilling in general. It's extremely quiet, um, which is good to know. Because I was I was bracing myself for you know some some complaints to, to come in, but we didn't we didn't have any at all. So um, the issues that we had were some unmapped coal seams, which the, con which the contractors uh, came across, 69 meters of void. This affected the sort of the borehole di diameter. So whilst the contractors did actually start wider than they, than they necessarily needed to, by the time they got to the bottom of the, um, in, in, uh, the 169 meters down, um, they, the, the, the diameter of the borehole was narrower than was expected because of the voids and the unmapped coal seams so that every time you go through a, 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 um, a void, you would have to put in another bit of casing so it's got narrower and narrower as, as, you, as you went down. Um, however, we got the results. Um, uh, nice chart there for people who, who, who likes charts, but um, the temperature, the results, uh, temperatures were, were was about 15.7 degrees Celsius, um, and that was 164 meters below ground level. Um, flow rate was 2.3 liters per second. Um, the, the key one there was the water level was 146 meters below ground level. So if we go back, you can see there, there was um, the, the, the water level fluctuated through the testing period, and then it just sort of leveled out at 146 meters. So from what Charlotte said before, you know, 100 meters, whilst 146 meters is still doable, it's gonna cost you more in terms of pumping the water out in um, terms of electrical cost.
so what were the next steps? We had to decide, um, well, there, was, there would have to be another borehole um, to be drilled. Um, this the call authority identified that it would need to go deeper. We, we, there was a number of options, um, 177 to 249 meters, but 249 meters one would probably be the better option. But obviously that comes with a you know, significant cost implication. So obviously, go back to, back to the funding issue. Um, we identified both again ERDF and um, the renewable heat incentive, but there's an awful lot of risk involved in that. So we did apply for um, ERDF again, and we were again successful. But at that same time, um, the government announced that the RHI was going to cease. Um, they also came up with this third allocation of tariff, um, allocation of tariff guarantees. But in terms of the time scales, they, they, they just proved to be too tight um, because the payback, in terms of just the financial payback for the project, if we were successful with both the ARDF and the RHI, it would have been three years uh, payback with ERDF only 29 years. So you can see that the, the, the cost implications for the local authority here. Um, that's based on current energy prices. So if gas went up, for example, and electricity went down, which we hope it will do, um, that could dramatically change. But at the moment, that that's that's what, and, and sorry, that was just with the ERDF as, as well. And that, that, that was for the majority of the, um, of, of the borehole cost, of the second borehole cost. So th the risk here is, is significant. Um, the RHI application would only be known at project completion. Um, there was some internal reluctance due to the revenue implications. Uh, there would need to be further design spend. There I say there was a bit of procrastination going on as well, but certainly RHI massively altered the risk profile. So the outcome is projects on hold. Whether or not that's indefinitely, we don't know. Um, we've got a hole in the ground. Um, we, that is still there and it's a resource. We it could still be used. And, you know, it, whether or not the, the building is there in you know in long terms whether or not the Lewis Center is, is there, whether or not we get a new leisure center in Stanley. If we do, then that's an opportunity that we would take um, potentially. But certainly lots of lessons have been learned. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that 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 that's 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 where we are. Um, th there is lots of other examples, um, and we are looking at other projects still. Um, one thing I would say that the Seam Garden Village project, which Charlotte highlighted before, that is, you know, that that's an example of where the coal authority are already pumping water up from from the seam already. You know, so that's great because. The resource is there, it's already been pumped up, so we're just going to utilize that where we've got to go in search of the resource um, and invest in the exploration and the, the, the pumping up of the water. It's a lot, lot more difficult, a lot more difficult. I'll leave it there. <laughs>